Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And today we're going to talk about somebody's third novel, I believe, and it's called The World Without You. The author is Willis is Joshua Hinkin. The publisher is Pantheon Books. Uh, you have written two other novels. One, one is called Swimming Across the Hudson, being the Hudson River, and the other one, Matrimony. And you also are the author of many short stories, get into some notable collections like Best American Short Stories, and people can pick you up on NPR's Selected Shorts. And most prestigiously, I think, he is the director of the program in fiction writing at Brooklyn College. That sounds very prestigious, <laughs> is it? I mean, I don't know if it's prestigious. Do but they it's love a, you at Brooklyn College? Uh, I love them. You know, I can't speak for them, but I'm very happy to be there, and I'm happy to be here with you, Jim. Is it is, is it hard work working with young first time authors? Um, well, first time to be published. Author. Right, it can be. I, I'm in a very fortunate situation in that um, we typically get 500 applicants for 15 spots. So statistically, for, what? for 15 spots, 500 applicants. Oh you heard me right. Oh, my goodness. So statistically, it's harder to get into Brooklyn College's fiction MFA program than it is to get into Harvard Medical School. Um, so I'm really working with the very best uh, young writers. In fact, in the last six months alone, five of our recent graduates have gotten book contracts. So it, in a lot of ways, it's a dream job. Well, oh, that must make you feel proud. Like I am proud. I mean, it's <laughs> The very, children have done well. Exactly, exactly. And I'm very proud of them. Yeah. The world, the world without you is, to me, in many ways, a kind of amazing book. It is, it is a, a very tightly focused book. And when you read it, you kind of get swallowed up by the family that it's about and the essential storyline. What, what, what is that essential storyline, would you say? Yeah, so the book takes place over a single July 4th holiday, over 72 hours. It takes place over July 4th in 2005. And the year before, July 4th, 2004, uh, Leo Frankel was a young journalist killed in Iraq. Um, and he left three sisters and two parents and a widow and a young son. And they all gather together a year later uh, in Lennox and the Berkshires for his memorial. And meanwhile, the parents, uh, their marriage is in trouble. They're starting to split up. Uh, the various sisters have issues they're struggling with. Uh, one of them has become an Orthodox Jew. Another one is trying to get pregnant and is failing. Uh, the widow, Thisbe, who's a graduate student in anthropology in Berkeley, uh, comes to the Berkshires also, and she has a secret of her own, namely that she has a new boyfriend. So there's a lot of stuff going on in a very short period of time. That's quite a stew you put together here. Yeah, well, that's what you, you want a novel to be a, a big stew so that there's a lot of characters to engage with. <laughs> And they're they're all in in their own way interesting, uh, sometimes likable, sometimes not not so likable. And uh, Marilyn, who is the mother, as bullheaded as ever, you write, wants to have Leo's memorial despite all these other things that are going on. She wants to have it exactly as we've been planning to have it. It's true. I mean, she wants to have everything exactly as she's been planning to have it. She's a bit of a ball in a china shop. Uh, David, her husband, is uh, somewhat quieter and more retiring. Um, and really what's what's broken up their marriage is that they haven't been able to grieve together. There's a moment in flashback to the book. Uh, touches on when uh, eight months after Leo's death, they're at a, par a cocktail party up at Columbia Presbyterian and they get into a conversation with a stranger and somehow the topic of children comes up and the stranger innocently asks them how many children they have. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. at the same moment, Marilyn says four and David says three. Yeah. And that in a, in a nugget uh, encapsulates the different ways they grieve and the way that they're grieving is incompatible. And then I, I think you're right that, you know, um, some as in life and fiction too, some characters are likable and some characters are less likable. And I guess my goal as a fiction writer is to make characters who are complicated and interesting and human. So if at the end of my book, the reader feels like he or she knows the characters as well as or better than the people in their own lives, then I feel I've succeeded in that regard. One of the things that Marilyn does, I guess one would say in response to the death of her son, which is, is not just being shot in combat, who was held prisoner and things like that, is that she has become what I would call the queen of the, of the op-ed. 
She has become the queen of the op-ed. She's written 24 op-eds over the course of the last year. She's kind of become the spokesperson and the mascot in some ways for the left. And, you know, most of her family shares her politics, although not all of them do. The one who's in Israel is actually a Bush supporter. But I think there's a feeling that the son that she's writing about in these op-eds is sort of unrecognizable to some of the other characters. And this is her way of channeling her grief. I think she wants there to be some positive outcome and some way in which, you know, Leo's memory can linger on uh, in the public. One of the things that I think you're very sly about is the father. Uh, David, uh, almost throughout the entire novel, seems to be very, t- very minor, uh, very, very withdrawn. And, and in fact, the women seem to do all the talking. But there are, but, but there are certain things that you have David do that are, that are really powerful. For example, uh, at, at one point, having you know, had it announced to him that there's going to be a separation, the house that they're in in, in Lenox, a beautiful part of Massachusetts, incidentally, uh, is going to be sold. And like any house that's going to be sold, it's got to be fixed up. So she becomes the queen of the op-ed page, and he becomes Mr. Repairman. He spends part of this time this weekend walking around with a with a bunch of tools. Yep. I mean, he becomes the, you know, self-declared handyman. And I think it's it's his form of, you know, quiet protest. And everything he does... Uh, is quiet. And he has a conversation before the memorial with Lily, the uh, middle daughter, yeah. about the differences between him and Marilyn. He says he's not one to bellow through bullhorns, but that doesn't mean he's grieving any less than Marilyn is. And I think he does, even though he's quieter, he has a kind of dignity that, that really comes out over the course of the number of pages. Yeah. And at the end, uh, he kind of helps tie everything together. He does. Um, he does. He's, yeah. uh, I mean, he. There aren't a lot of fireworks with what he does, mm-hmm. but what he does is very important to the family, absolutely. In the world without you, there are many tensions, sibling rivalries, old battles not forgotten, things like that. And then there, there is one in t- tension, if you will, that seems to have inspired the novel. We'll look at that when we return. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. This is Conversations on the Coast. I'm Jim Foster and I'm talking today to the author of a novel. His name is Joshua Henkin. The title of his latest book is The World Without You. And it is published by Pantheon. And an old friend of ours here, Julia Glass, author of many books, but of a book called The Widower's Tale, which we interviewed her for here on the program, says this about uh, Mr. Henkin's book. Rich, deep, funny, and wise. This is a sumptuous layer cake. I love that. Sumptuous layer cake of a novel whose ordinary yet urgent dramas remind us that family is where it all begins. Henkin is a writer of voluminous heart, humanity, and talent. Congratulations. Julia says it. it's true. That's my opinion. <laughs> uh-huh. Now, there are many tensions going on in this, uh, in this book, sibling rivalries and the, the past history catching up with the family and, and things like that. But uh, you wrote in, a, in another place that uh, when a parent loses a child, they almost never move on. And moving on is one of the things that, in a sense, everyone would like to do in this book. Right. Leo was beloved, I think. He was the, the youngest child, a late child. And the, the three daughters doted over him, in, each in her own way. And now he's gone, gone tragically, a victim of the war. And they've lost him, but also the parent has lost the child. Right. And they can't move on. Yeah. No, I think that is, you know, one of the central tensions, perhaps the central tension in the book, 
um, you know, whether they can move on, do they want to move on, how they feel about that. And, you know, the inspiration for the book um, comes from a story in my family. Uh, I had a cousin who died of Hodgkin's disease in his late 20s, and I was only a toddler at the time, so I didn't really know him. But his death hung over the family for years, and uh, we we have an annual family reunion, and a lot of us don't see each other during the course of the year. And at the beginning of the reunion, you know, we catch each other up on what's been going on. And one year, when I was in my early 30s, my aunt got up and said, I have two sons. And we were all startled because she'd once had two sons, but her older son had died nearly 30 years ago at that point. And I think this was her way of saying that this was the singular seminal event in her life, and there was no getting over that. Meanwhile, my cousin's wife uh, did move on. She got remarried. She had a family. Um, and there was always tension between her and, I guess, what you call her ex-mother-in-law, my aunt. And that got me thinking about the difference between what it's like to lose a spouse and what it's like to lose a child. That generally, if you lose a spouse relatively young, you tend to pick up the pieces eventually, as hard as that is, and move on. But I think parents generally don't move on. And so and that tension was the initial inspiration for the book. And then as I started to write, things got more complicated and the sisters came in. But initially, it was that gap in grieving that you're talking about. Yeah, it it, it reminds me, as you uh, tell that story, in my own family life, I had an aunt who had one son, Arthur, who was killed in World War II. If you talk to the Army, you're not sure if he was killed before or after it ended by a sniper. And she could not move on. She absolutely had to change her geographic location because she spent so much time in the old house cursing Franklin Delano Roosevelt for right. killing her son. Very similar, you know, to Marilyn's. Right, black. they're cursing George Bush, a different kind of president, but they're cursing, cursing him uh, for having killed their son. Yeah. And I think for Marilyn in some ways, and this may be part of the reason she and David are separating, is that she feels that it's, it's capitulation to move on. That if you move on, then on some level you are tainting the memory uh, of the child. I mean, that's like a real gap between Marilyn and David, whereas David feels more inclined to accept what has happened, even though it's really hard for him. Mm -hmm. He has trouble, you know, saying, I'm going to stay and not move on. I don't want to leave the impression that they're, that they're, they're not some, uh, wonderful, almost fun parts in this book. When a family this large gathers together in one place, they've got to do things like even play games. They're, and they they play a game called Celebrity, mm -hmm. but like so much here, it blows up. Yeah, a lot of things blow up in this book. And I think that that's an important point you're making, is that although obviously there's a tragedy at the heart of the book, um, it's not at core a depressing book. And the Celebrity Game involves people giving clues and putting names of famous people and seeing who can guess the most. And Amram and Noel, who are from Jerusalem and have become Orthodox, essentially rig the game by putting down names of sort of famous Orthodox <laughs> rabbis and the like. Um, and then when the rest of the family picks up these clues, they think that they're in a foreign language. And so that's one of the games, the tennis game. There, there's a lot of competition throughout the book, and there is a good deal of fun in addition to everything else. Yeah. Well... There's a lot of competition in the book and a lot of poignant moments. And uh, when we come back, we're going to hear one of them directly from the author. Don't miss it. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Joshua Henkin is our guest. He's a distinguished author and he's also a big guy at Brooklyn College, guiding people through their MFA program there. The book he's talking about today is his latest novel, The World Without You, and it's published by Pantheon Books. One of the people, one of the many characters in here whom we haven't mentioned is Thisbe. Thisbe is the widow of Leo. And there's a, a, a moment in, in the book when... Uh, having arrived, she goes through the summer home in Lenox, Massachusetts, and it's beautifully written, and I wish you'd share it with us. Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, so Thisbe has traveled in from Berkeley, where she's a graduate student in anthropology, uh, with her son Calder, who's three years old, her and Leo's son, and Thisbe has never gotten along 
uh, with Marilyn, her mother-in-law. And this is the first moment when she is back in the house. This is the house where she met Leo uh, her summer after her junior year of college. And so she's wandering through the house now. Upstairs in the hallway, everything is as she remembers it. The Catholic hall with etchings on the wall, the faded portraits of Leo's great-grandparents, the old charcoal street map of Paris. On a glass table sit the family photos, where Thisbe finds a younger version of herself standing next to Leo at his Wesleyan graduation, and another photo from their wedding at the New York Aquarium, she in her wedding gown holding a glass of champagne, and behind her in his tank, the walrus pressed against the glass, making his walrus noises. That walrus alone, Leo used to say, was worth the cost of the wedding. He kept referring to the walrus as his best man. In another photograph, this one taken after Leo's death, she's holding Calder, just two years old. In all these photos, she plays a supporting role, the girlfriend, the wife, the mother, though there's also one of her alone in a yellow sundress, a look of perplexity across her face, taken when she isn't sure. This photo in particular makes her feel obscurely violated, which is strange, because for years there were no photos of her in the house, and she took this as evidence that she wasn't welcomed by Leo's parents, at least not by Marilyn, who from the start was suspicious of her, why she doesn't know. The only reason she can come up with is that she wasn't Nora, Leo's high school girlfriend, who lingered on haphazardly into college, showing up in Middletown when she and Leo weren't with someone else to perpetrate another act of high drama. The girl with the extra toe, Thisbe called Nora, which she understood was mean-spirited, though Nora did in fact have an extra toe at the base of where her, two, her first two toes met, and was, besides, the least remarkable thing about her. More remarkable was her capacity for self-destruction, for putting things into her body that didn't belong, and failing to put in things that did. Leo's mother helped Nora get treatment for drugs, for anorexia, and because of this, and because Leo knew Laura, Nora as long as he did, they were in the same nursery school class in Morningside Heights, Marilyn saw Nora as a surrogate daughter and was almost as protective of her as Leo was. The happy girlfriend, Marilyn called Thisbe. Why? Because she was blonde and pretty and from California? Because she didn't have an eating disorder? Thisbe was tempted to protest that she wasn't happy, and to argue at the same time that happiness was nothing to be ashamed of, both of which led her down a path she didn't wish to take of defending herself to her boyfriend's mother. What had Marilyn been hoping for? That Leo would marry Nora? It should be illegal, Thisbe thinks, to marry someone you dated in high school. Marrying someone you dated in college is hard enough. The story goes that after Thisbe was born, her parents made placenta soup. It was a ludicrous ritual, but this was Santa Cruz in the 1970s when everyone was engaged in ludicrous rituals, and she was only a few days old at the time. It wasn't her idea to make placenta soup, but Marilyn saw this story as confirmation of what Thisbe thinks, that she's a pagan, that she wasn't worthy of Marilyn's darling son. From the start, David was more generous. Thisbe likes David, but he was overshadowed by Marilyn, who has the larger, blunter personality. Over time, Thisbe grew fonder of Marilyn, but for years she felt as if she were competing with the ghost of Nora and with the photos of her that still remained in the house long after Leo and she had broken up. Standing in the hallway in front of the family photos, Thisbe feels vindicated, but she experiences it as false consolation because now that she's been given such a prominent place on the mantle, she isn't sure she wants to be there. The beautiful part about that writing, and one of the beautiful things about that writing, is how economical it is, how much you find out about a couple of characters in a, in a, in a very short time. One of the characters that I can't forget, who kind of plays a minor part, Gretchen. Mm -hmm. Gretchen is the grandma. Right. Gretchen is the one with the money. Gretchen is the one who, you know, comes in for the denouement. It's true. Gretchen is the character who plays a minor part until she plays a major part. And she's <laughs> sort of a, she's sort of the grand puppeteer in the family. She is ninety-four years old, in perfect health. She lives alone in a huge apartment on Park Avenue in New York City. 
Um, she has been. And I widowed. have the feeling she never takes off the white gloves. She probably doesn't. She <laughs> might have been born with the white gloves. Yeah. You know, she was more. She was married to David's uh, to David's father, who died quite young, and she subsequently got remarried twice, each time to a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, who then died, and so she and they didn't have children, and so she inherited all their money. And she is a, a manipulative character who's always orchestrating things from the background. And she comes up at the end, to, for, as you said, for the, for the novel's denouement. That's when all the characters are there, like in a, a Greek tragedy. She'd also be a great estate planner, I think. She probably would. <laughs> she probably would. <laughs> there, aren't, uh, there, there, there aren't too many characters in this book. And this author has control of all of them. And he takes you on a wonderful, wonderful ride. It's a book that you should get hold of while you can. It may sell out one of these days <laughs> soon. It's called The World Without You. The author, Joshua Henkin, and this has been Conversations on the Coast. I'm Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster C-O-C, or send an email to Jim Foster C-O-C at gmail.com.